this is this is algebra absolutely 100 percent yep that's why it's called linear algebra uh if you take a course in college on math there's literally a course called linear algebra where is my presentation Did I close it down? No, here it is. There we go. All right, e-learners, if you're wondering what we were doing, we were taking our quiz. Your quiz is posted. You also have 15 minutes to take your quiz. Not 15 minutes from right now, but uh, 15 minutes when you decide to take your quiz. Take your quiz. Don't take any more than 15 minutes. All right, uh, everyone. Say again. Did it take you longer than 15? I'm not worried. All right. Uh, here's the calendar. Like I said, we had two things left scatter plots. Uh, and then uh, the last thing tomorrow, it will be very weird for some people. Boy, is it easy. It just has a lot of new terms, some new symbols that we haven't seen this year. It's, it's really simple. All right, your homework will be that worksheet right there. I'm not gonna speed through it necessarily. No, let's wait until the end of class. Uh, I'm not gonna speed through it. Um, I teach both an honors algebra one and a regular, al al this is a regular algebra one. There's parts in this instruction that are more geared toward the honors part. I'm gonna skip over that part. We're just gonna talk about scatter plots. What are they? How do you use them? Uh, how do you interpret them? That sort of thing. All right, there's a lot of things right here. Uh, they're all easy, with one exception, that one right there. Okay, and it's only hard because it's ugly, ugly, ugly numbers. Typically, when you have a scatter plot. All right, that's a scatter plot. Uh, it is a plot or a graph with a lot of, and they look to be scattered all over the place. Hence, that's why it's literally called a scatter plot. One of the few times that math people gave it a good name. All right, this is a graph of height uh, to weight. Right? Every dot represents one person, and they ask that person, how tall are you, uh, how much do you weigh? And they made a graph of it. Right? If you haven't already figured this out, taller people in general weigh more than shorter people. In general, there are certainly some fat short people, and there's certainly some skinny tall people. Right. But if we were to plot, and I'm, I'm sorry for bringing up height and weight, some people, that's a sensitive issue. Um, I'd love to say get over it, but I understand for a lot of people it's a sensitive. But unfortunately, it's a good math uh, uh, scatter plot. Um, so, yeah, the reason why the dots are kind of scattered all around there is because, right, it's not, if everyone is 70 inches as human beings, we're not all the same weight, right? Uh, it's kind of, uh, this, the, those weights are distributed around that height. However, if you look at the graph and you kind of squint, you can kind of see that the graph goes in what direction? It goes in an upward direction. And that's the idea of scatter plot. We think that there might be some correlation between height and weight until we actually graph it. We're not sure. If there's no correlation, guess what the shape would look like? If there was no relationship between height and weight, guess what the dots would look like? If they made a line, that would be perfect correlation. It would just be a big honking circle of dots. And I don't mean like a little circle, like the whole thing would be filled full of dots. No relationship, no pattern. Pattern? Something will emerge. And most people look like saying, I don't see a pattern. If you squint, you can kind of see the dots are moving in an upward direction. Okay? That's the idea of scatter plot. Believe it or not, in the field of science, and we want to figure out, are there, is there causation or correlation between two things? We almost always use a scatter plot, right? Uh, the classic one you'll see a lot of math books is smoking and death, right? Right. For a long time, they said smoking was healthy for you. Literally, they said, you want good health, smoke cigarettes, right? It wasn't until scientists really started looking at the data, scatter plots, that show the more you smoke, the more percentage or the likelihood of you to get lung cancer, throat cancer, mouth cancer. It was through the use of scatter plots that a lot of decisions of one, whether something works or it doesn't work are found out. All right, in box number uh, one, write this down, please. There's gonna be just two things. 
first of all, what's the definition of a scatter plot? Well, it's a graph, right? And it's a graph that relates two different things, not one, but two. Right, Ron? Right, two different things. Now, in math, we call those sets. So we got a set of data. And each data point is represented by a dot or a point on the graph. Uh, most of the time, scatter plots are made with little red circles or black circles. Sometimes they're made with triangles, but there's no rhyme or reason of what one, why use one or the other. You basically take your two data points, your height and your weight, that turns into a point, an X and a Y, you graph it. Now, not always, but I don't know what the percent is, pretty darn high. Most of the time when I collect data, do you ever get a negative number? I mean, if I ask you how many sisters you have and how many brothers you have, you don't get negative numbers, right? If I ask you your height and your weight, you don't get negative numbers. If I ask you how much money you spent on this and how many, uh, I don't know, brothers you have, those are all positive numbers. So not always, but most of the time, scatter plots are not shown as your full X and Y coordinates. It's just quadrant one, where both the X and the Y are positive. Now you can get negative numbers. We did temperatures, we can certainly get a negative number. Okay. But generally speaking, most scatter plots are just shown in the first quadrant, meaning I don't put the full y axis and the full x axis because they would just be empty. So we typically just show quadrant one. And most graphs are like that. I mean, rarely do you see a graph where it shows all four quadrants. Normally things are positive when we get data. Hey, how many hairs are on the top of your head? And how many sweet tarts do you eat on a monthly basis? Those are, I don't know if there's a correlation between those two things, uh, but that's literally what some scientists do sometimes. They come up with these weird ideas about is a relationship between the amount of sugar and the amount of hair that you grow on your body. I don't know. I'm, I literally just made that up on the spot, but that's something that scientists get paid money to investigate. That's the standard scientific model. If somebody comes up with a hypothesis, hey, why is that kid running around acting like a fool? Every single time they eat candy, oh, maybe there's something going on. So they, they do a study, which is does sugar have an effect upon activity in children? So they do a scatter plot of, okay, this kid ate so many grains of sugar, and this is how many uh, myths they ran around like a fool, right? I'm, I'm not a scientist. That's clearly not a scientific idea there, but. The general idea there would be something that maybe some people explore. Oh, by the way, I met your brother yesterday. And he's nothing like me. I know, that's what you said. Because yeah. they said this last time, they're like, wait, oh, what is your brother? Yeah. I said, well, you two don't even act like at all. All right. These are stylistic uh, scatter plots. You'll see this in every single math book. You know, you take uh, math in college, a statistics course, they always do scatter plots. They always show this graph. And they are the perfect scatter. Hey, here's a this is an honest to God real scatter plot. Real scatter plots look like this a mess of dots. And you got to squint to see a pattern. And then in a math book, I show you these really pretty ones, right? You can clearly see the dots are doing what? Scattering. They're, they're not scattering, they're staying together. And they're going in an upward direction. Here they're going in a. And here there's no pattern whatsoever. Okay, this is the only true scatter plot right here. The rest are like a math book scatter plot. Uh, we give names to these patterns, okay? Uh, we use uh, scatter plots to identify if there's something going on in the data. If there's nothing going on, you just get random dots all over the place. But this is clearly showing that as, y, as X increases, so does your Y values increase. This is clearly showing as your X increases, your Y values decrease. There's something going on. If a scientist saw this, this is like Nobel Prize territory right here. If they ever made a scatter plot that looked like either one of these, this is like, this is drop dead proof that something's going on. Most scatter plots look like this. Okay, so we're gonna give names to this, right? And it's called correlation. Correlation is just a fancy word for, there's something going on, right? There is a, literally there's a correlation between the amount of time that you spend studying and the grades that you get, okay? The more time that you spend studying, the higher your grade is. That's like an honest to God correlation. Okay? The less time you spend, the lower your grade is. We call it, when it looks like this, we call this positive correlation. This one right here, this is box two. Okay? 
positive correlation is when the dots go in an upward direction. Hey, it's got a positive slope. Positive correlation. That means as the X value increases, so does the Y. If that's positive, oh, some examples would be, I don't know, your age to your height. As you get older, your height increases up until you know the end of puberty and then no longer, right? Um, I made this one up. I don't know if this is true, but the more chores you get, the more allowance you get. Usually I get some pushback on that one. If this is positive correlation, what's this one? Negative. So give me an example of negative correlation. As something increases, something else decreases. Give me something that increases that causes something else to decrease. The more periods that you have in school, the less free time you have at home. Very good. All right? That would be negative correlation. Here's a couple other ones. Hey, um, grade at not like ABCD, but your grade level, like first grade, second grade, third grade. As that grade level increases, the number of baby teeth decrease. Not because you get into fights and they get knocked out, right? But because they fall out naturally, hopefully. Uh, as the weight of a car increases, then typically your MPG goes down because it becomes less efficient, right? Uh, if that's positive, that's negative correlation. What's this correlation? If this is positive, negative, what's the correlation here? So we literally call that no correlation. Hey, what's the correlation between your cell phone number and your age? There isn't any. Your cell phone number depends upon where you buy your cell phone. It has nothing to do with how old you are. Uh, the number of pets to your height. How tall you are has nothing to do with how many pets you have. It has nothing to do with each other. If we were to graph that, if I said, how tall are you, how many pets? We would literally, in this class, we would get a graph that looked like this. If we had gone back and I go into this school, and I do every student in the school and I say, what grade are you in? How many baby teeth you have? Anybody still have baby, baby teeth? I had baby teeth until seventh grade. Yeah. But by eighth grade, I had zero, right? Baby teeth. I know I was very slow and I didn't get braces until I was a sophomore. I was very conscious about it too. Everybody else was out of braces and I was just getting mine on sophomore year. I felt bad, All right? All right, scatter plots. Now, this is like a more realistic scatter plot of negative correlation right here. Uh, as the dots get closer and closer and closer together, we say that the correlation becomes stronger and stronger, right? This is like near impossible to ever get in the real life. There's always that one kid that does something weird, right? Hey, I ate 400 pounds of sugar and I still don't have diabetes, right? Uh, the rest of us, you know, if we ate that much, things happen to us. Uh, we give names to this as the dots go farther apart or closer together, even though they all have negative correlation, uh, we call this perfect correlation, right? That would be like laws or something. Every time you speed, you get a ticket. Uh, in the real life, generally speaking, we have weak because humans are slightly different from each other. So the effect of medicine, the effect of food, the effect of sleep on, has slightly different effects on everyone. Uh, generally speaking, if you don't have any sleep, bad things happen, right? But some people can literally get by on four hours of sleep. It would be perfectly fine. I don't get eight hours of sleep. I'm very cranky. All right. So a real honest to God scatter plot looks like this. Rarely do you get perfect correlation. Well, we would call this middle one strong. So you might encounter these words again, and that works for both uh, negative and positive correlation. Strong correlation or perfect means the dots are really close together. Weak just means the dots are, but you can still see a pattern. Like I said, generally speaking, when they were doing the efficacy of the, you know, the COVID vaccination and they do a scatter plot, it's going to look more like this than it's going to look like this because some people can get the vaccine and still catch COVID, right? All right, so let's make a quick scatter plot. So watch me real quickly, I'll do one for you and then we'll do one together. To make a scatter plot, you first need data that has two things attached to it, height and weight or something. 
So this is two things, a plane's out, airplane, a plane's altitude and the outside temperature. Remember, scatter plot, you need two things. So at zero meters, that's the temperature in Fahrenheit. At uh, very high up, 5,000 meters, that's 15,000 feet or so. That's the degrees outside in Fahrenheit. It's cold. If you didn't already know this. Higher up you go, the colder it gets. Well, a very accurate thermometer, right? That you can measure in less than a, in a tenths of degrees. All right, if I graph these points, you're going to have to trust me that I made the graph correctly. As I graph these points, what do you notice about the general shape of the graph? Positive, negative, or no correlation? Negative. Got negative correlation. As the, as the elevation increases, the temperature decreases. It's not perfect. Hey, the temperature was initially going up as we went up in uh, altitude. But even though there's a couple one that uh, go against the grain of the trend, eventually the trend emerges when we put enough dots on there. That's usually what happens. You always get these outlier points, points that are far away from the other data. That's a scatter plot. Today we'll be doing something with the scatter plot, not just make a scatter plot. Questions? Uh, the hardest thing about a scatter plot is typically the axes have different values. Hey, I'm going up by tens but I'm going left to right by 500s. So because it's real world, world data, and it's got weird stuff, it's got weird numbers. Generally speaking, you can't go by ones on your graph. So let's make one. Hey, this is your box, whatever it is, big on there. It's dollars spent to gallons that you buy of gasoline. How much money you spend? If you go and you buy one day 10 gallons of gas or $10 worth of gas, right? The price kind of fluctuates, goes up and down. So if you just put one dot, you don't get a good idea of what's happening to the prices as you buy more. As we put more dots on there, the pattern emerges. All right, so here's how it's done when you really make a, a, a scatter plot. First off, your X values, right? I need to go from here to here. What are we gonna go by? Two. We can go by twos and we would literally have to go up to 10 and we would be done. If we went two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. Our graph didn't use any part over here. We would like our data to be distributed all the way across. Ten. We go by tens, you're done on the first square. Maybe go by ones or maybe even 0.5s. I'll let you make the decision on your graph what you go by. I, I have a lot of squares, you only have what, 10? Yeah. I would suggest let's go by on your graph, ones. So on the bottom, write dollars. And you said we're going by ones. Oh, there's 13. Mm. So maybe you guys need to go by twos on yours. That makes sense? All right. Uh, gallons. What's the biggest number we got up here? What's the biggest number we got up there? 3.3, not 33. If we went by ones, we would be done on the third line or the fourth line. So maybe this one we might want to go, depending upon how many squares you have, 10. All right, you might want to go by 0.2, maybe. That makes sense? For the vertical one, so the vertical one, you're going to put gallons. And then you're going to make your scatter plot. So to make your scatter plot, one point at a time, the first point is 10, 2.5. You went by well, twos or ones on your x-axis? You went by dose? Okay, so you're going to count by twos until you get to 10. So for yours, you'd go two, four, six, eight, 10. And then you'd go up and you said you went by 0 0.2. 0 0.5, that'll still work. So if I went by 0 0.2, it'd be 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 1, 1 1.2, 1 1.4, 1 1.6. Boy, it would help if we wrote the numbers off to the side to speed things up, okay? So off to the side, you don't have to do it for every tick mark. Put a couple there just to help you out. For me, I'm gonna go by ones. So if I went by ones, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, okay. And then I said I was gonna go by, do I have enough to go by point one? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nope, I don't. I have to put point two. So that's point two. 
four, six, eight, one, 1.2, 1 1.6, 1 1.8, 2, 2.2, 2.4, 2.6, 2.8, 3, 3.2, 3.4, and I think 3.3 was the highest one. There we go. Now we go one dot by one dot or one point by one point and we plug in our points. I've got 10, 2.5. So I go to 10, straight up to 2.5. 2.5 would be halfway between 2.4 and 2.6. I'm right there. Boom, there's my first dot. You only graph one dot, you see nothing but a point. The pattern doesn't emerge until you have all your points in there. My second point is 11, 2.8. So here is 11, 2.8. There's two, four, uh, two, four, six, eight. There's my, oh, I almost see a pattern, maybe. Nine, 2.3. So here's nine, there's 2.4, so 2.3. Oh yeah, I see a pattern, definitely. 10 and 2.6, 10, oh, there's another, oh, I got two tens. I got another point right here. That'll happen in a scatter plot. 13 and 3.3, is your pencil moving, Aiden? No. Move it. 13, 3.3, 3.2, so 3.3 would be right there. Five and 1.3, five and 1.2.3 would be right there. Yeah, there's definitely a pattern. Eight and 2.2, .2, uh, nine, eight, 2.2, .2, nine, eight, and 2.2, there's two, 2.2 .2 would be right there. And lastly, four and 1.1, four and 1.1. There we go, there's my scatter plot. There's dots scattered all over there, but I see a pattern. What's the correlation here? Positive, negative, or no correlation? Positive. It's definitely positive correlation. You can see as the more dollars you spend, you can buy more gallons of gas. Hey, Mr. C, I need a scatter plot to figure that out now. Agreed. Why aren't the dots in a perfect line? One day you go to the gas store, the gas is, I don't know, $3 a gallon. One day you go, it's $2.98. One day you go, it's $3.10. But generally speaking, the more you buy, the more it costs. Who's lost in what we just did? Tonight for homework, you have two that you have to do. That's it. Just two that you have to actually make a graph. The rest are just interpreting graphs. We okay? All right. Usually the hardest thing is just figuring out what your axes should be. And tonight for homework, I'm already going to give that for you. Yeah. It just depends. Sometimes you have uh, an independent and a dependent variable. For instance, um, the amount of gallons you buy depends upon how much money you spend. So this one, X is definitely your dollars. Uh, if you cook a turkey, how long you leave it in the oven is dependent upon how much it weighs, right? You look on the label, label it says, hey, you know, for every five pounds of turkey, I'm, I'm making this part up, uh, you know, cook it for an hour. All right, you ready for the easiest thing? This is something called a trend line. A trend line is when you have a scatter plot and you literally draw a line that represents the dots. What do I mean by represent? I mean, the line is going in the direction that the dots are going. And it's generally surrounded by the dots. When you make a trend line, this is the, the least, uh, when you get to high, or high school, when you get to college, if you do this, there's a formula for this. But in high school, they ask you to draw a trend line. You just draw a line that goes in the direction of the dots that goes through the dots. What do I mean by that? I mean that. Do you see the blue line, Chris? Do you want to go through all the dots? So you can't go through all the dots because then it would be a wiggly, jagged line. So you need a straight line. The general rules, and they are really general, just simply say this. I would like the dots to be evenly distributed around the blue line. Generally, what that means is you got the same number of dots above as you got below, generally speaking. It turns out that when I ask everyone to draw a trend line, they all basically go in the same direction. They're all generally there. There is a formula for it. It's pretty complicated. You ever take a probability statistics class? It's called line of best fit. Your calculator does it for you. Um, 
But when we ask you in high school to draw a trend line, we mean freehand that sucker straight though. If I freehanded this one, could you do it? It would look like that. I generally speak, I mean, I'm really not counting dots. I'm just saying but where are the dots going, it looks like that. Be slightly careful, but don't spend five minutes trying to make it perfect. Could you do that by yourself? They're going to ask you to do that, literally. It's the easiest thing ever in math. So do it. Flip your paper over. Oh, I didn't give you any. All right. I do have uh, on this uh, this one to have you. So you're going to draw a trend line. Now, why would you even draw a trend line? You draw a trend line to help you make predictions about what the data is saying. It will make more sense if I do it. So here's the, uh, the first one I gave you, right? If I draw a trend line, a trend line will help me answer questions about the data. So it says, what is the expected temperature at 2,250 meters? Now check this out. If I go to 2,250, that's about right here. And if I look straight up, is there a dot there? There is no dot there. So it's hard to answer that question unless you draw a trend line. Now, if I draw a trend line, and now I go to 2,250, Chris, and I go straight up, do I hit the blue line? And then I can look straight across. Here's 2,250, it goes straight up to the blue line and then straight across, what's the temperature? What is it? Here's 2,250, I'm right here. If I go straight across, I'm right here. So slightly above 40, maybe 41, right? That's why you draw a trend line. It will help you in your predictions, okay? Tonight for homework, they're gonna give you a scatter plot. You're gonna make a trend line. They're gonna give you questions. You're gonna use the trend line to help you make predictions. Oh, by the way, I can go over here as well too. I mean, it, the, the line doesn't stop. All right, trend lines allow you to predict the answer. Big fancy words, I'm throwing them out there just in case you ever see it. If they're asking you to predict something that happens between the dots, between the dots, it's called interpolation. If they ask you something up here, there's no dots up there. That's called extrapolation. You've got, you've got to be careful with extrapolation. Why? Think about it. If I gave you, if I asked you to make a graph of age and height, what would it look like? It would look like this, right, until puberty, and then it would look like, and then for some old ladies, it would look like that, right? You get shorter as you get older. The issue with extrapolation is you have no data points for extrapolation. You're just predicting what will happen in the future without any data, and you can get into problems. Hey, if it's something that always increases, you can make a great prediction. But if it's something weird, like, well, you, things go up and then they go horizontal, they go down, you get to the, the wrong conclusion. Uh, if we were to extrapolate age and height, we would say that a 77-year-old man was 1,000 feet tall, right? If you grew as much as you grew between ages zero to, say, 10, you'd be 1,000 feet tall by 77. And clearly, we know that doesn't happen, unless you read Lord of the Rings. All right. And turn into a tree. All right. Uh, this would be the honest part. We're not going to talk about this, but it talks about that you can use what we just took our quiz on to actually come up with the equation of the line. There are a couple of questions on the homework that ask you to use the formula. So let me show you how this is done. So I'm not going to have you do the hard part, which is come up with the equation, but I am going to ask you to use the equation. So here's the idea. You get data. Is it with me? You make a chart, a scatter plot. You draw a trend line and you come up with the equation of this blue line, which is you just did that on your quiz. The only difference was you shouldn't be packing up. The only difference is you don't have nice friendly numbers. You get weird numbers, right? But you can come up with the equation of that line. Tonight for homework, they're going to give you the equation. You don't have to come up with it. But this is the same thing that we just did on the quiz. Calculate B, calculate the slope, come up with the final equation. There's the final equation. Ugly, right? But this equation will now allow you to tell anything you want to know about this graph. This says age to weight. Give me an age that's not on the graph. 32. 40, 
40, 11 is not an age. 32. Hey. Out of the classroom right now, Aiden. Out of the classroom right now. Out. Okay. So we're going to do 32, yes? All right. Uh, uh, age is what? X or Y? On my graph, the age is the X or the Y? You see it's the X? So you want to calculate 32 years old. That's your X value. Plug it in right there and guess what? Do that calculation. In other words, 5.2 times 32 minus 3.7. That will tell you how much you weigh. There you go. 13, I probably don't even need this formula. I can predict it. it's going to be about right here, which is 48, 50, I don't know, whatever those are going up by. But the issue is when this is much larger than 13, right? 32, for instance. Okay. All right. That's what you're going to have tonight for homework on a couple of these. If you can look at the graph, you come up with the number with your trend line. If not, then you need to use the formula, plug in the new x value. Sierra, yours over here, too. Yours over there, too. Pass behind you. I would give one more minute. Anybody live today? Yes. What was the name for the data outside? Extrapolation. 